الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إبتنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المكتوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Ma sha Allah, Ma sha Allah. Well done, well done, and congratulations to your parents as well. Ma sha Allah, you can tell that they have put effort into teaching their daughter how to recite Quran. May Allah preserve her and all of the children here. May Allah preserve all of our children. Beautiful to see, Ma sha Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-anbiya al-mursalin. Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Beginning with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh to all of you brothers and sisters and children. And uh, we will now have a short talk, um, continuing our journey studying the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So far, we have reached a point in his life where he's now 40 years old and something monumental is about to happen in his life, something that is going to actually turn his life upside down because he goes from being somebody who is respected and loved amongst his community to being someone who is detested and hated by most and in fact some of those people are his own family members. So what happens is that at the age of 40 three strange things start happening to the Prophet The first is that uh, this is a report coming from his wife Aisha that the Prophet said I started to hear rocks, stones, and trees giving me salam. So he'd be walking wherever he used to walk and sometimes he would hear the voice of someone giving him salam and in the beginning he thought he was hearing things but later on he realized it is actually coming from certain rocks and trees and later on he would say I can spot that rock that used to give me salam up until today. He didn't know how to interpret this, he didn't know how to understand what was happening here, but these were some of the signs Allah was giving him to show him that something is about to change your life. This was the first thing. The second thing is that he started to see clear dreams. And the way he described it is like the rising of the sun, i.e. he would see something that is about to happen the next day and the thing would happen in exactly the same way that he had seen in his dream. Just like the rising of the sun is something that is indisputable, so too were his dreams coming true. And later on, he would actually say that a true dream is 146th of prophecy, meaning that anybody who is, uh, anybody can have a dream and it could be true. And if it is a true dream, that is a sign that Allah has actually placed that dream into your mind whilst you're asleep, just like He would reveal something greater to the Prophets of Allah. Just out of interest here, does anyone have experienced true dreams regularly? <coughs> no? One of my teachers, well, I used to have regularly true dreams, and they were very cryptic as well. Like, if you heard them, you'd be like, this is just in saying there's no meaning to it. Then he would tell somebody who is an expert in dream interpretation and they would tell him the exact uh, interpretation of the dream. Yes, there was uh, an incident where uh, there was a, you know like they do Q Islam Q&A on the TV? So there was a famous sheikh, his name is Abdurrahman al-Dadu. Does anyone know about this sheikh? He's one of the most famous sheikhs in the world right now. Some say he's the most, one of the most knowledgeable people in the world right now as well. He actually comes to Al Jazeera sometimes, or not on their news channel, but on their documentary one. Anyway, he was doing the Islam Q&A, and people were phoning in to get, ask him the questions. And the lady phoned in, and she said, I had, a true, I had a dream, and I don't know this interpretation. So she said, uh, the dream is that I see a man. He is in front of the Kaaba and he's surrounded by people that are trying to attack him and in his mouth he has a grenade 
Yes, and the people are closing in on him and he is standing near the Kaaba and he has a grenade in his mouth. What is the interpretation of this dream? Now when you hear this dream you feel like this is just uh, some weird dream that this old lady had. Maybe she was watching some crime thriller the night before or something and it's just like making a weird dream in her mind. So the Sheikh said that this dream has a specific interpretation. And the interpretation is that this man is a righteous man. And he is so righteous that he has many enemies in this world. And those enemies are trying to attack him. As for the grenade, it represents his dua. And if he wanted, he could unleash this grenade on those people, destroying all of them. But out of mercy, he does not make dua against them. And then the lady said, Sheikh, the man in my dream is you. The man in the dream is this Sheikh, the one who's answering that dream. SubhanAllah, amazing, isn't it? That is Sheikh Abdurrahman al Dadu. Yes, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. You can search him on Google, on YouTube, you'll see many of his uh, videos there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve the Sheikh. So the Prophet, he, used to saw, he's, he began seeing true dreams, vivid dreams. And again, this was a sign that something monumental is about to take place. In any case, the third thing that happened to him was that he started to yearn to be alone. And even though he's a married man with many children, he decided that he would take trips, leaving his home, going to the outside of Mecca and climbing up a mountain inside Ghar Hira to spend time alone. Now, we're out in the desert here right now. And there's lights, and there's people, and there's horses and quad bikes and everything else. But imagine if you were here by yourself, how would you feel? Would you like to be here by yourself? Huh? No. Imagine there's no lights, there's no one, and you are by yourself. What would you want to do? Run home, isn't it? Now imagine you're not just in the desert, you're actually on top of a mountain, inside a dark cave. Would anyone like to be in that situation? I don't think many people, right? But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he began to love that. To the point that the only time he would come back home is when the food his wife had packed for him had run out. What would he do in the cave at that time? Aisha says, Which in Arabic means that he used to do some form of worship. Now he doesn't yet know how to worship Allah. He's not a prophet of Allah, nor does he have any religion that he can follow. So all he's doing is he's worshipping Allah based on fitrah. Do you know what fitrah is? Fitrah is basically the uh, natural good conscious that Allah has placed in every single human being. It's like a moral compass that every human being has, whether you're Muslim, whether you're non-Muslim, everybody has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. Isn't that true? Everybody knows that murder is wrong and cheating is wrong and stealing is wrong and everybody also knows that being honest, just and upright is good. Where did that come from? Did anyone teach you that? Or was it inside of you? It is inside of you, isn't it? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitra. Every baby is born with a fitra. Meaning everyone who is born is born with an ingrained instinct to know certain things that are good and certain things that are evil. And one of them is to know that there is only one God. That there is only one entity, being who created us. And that that being has a right to be worshipped. How they should be worshipped, praying five times a day, all the do's and don'ts. The fitrah doesn't teach us that, but it gets us somewhere close to that. Does that make sense? So in this time, the Prophet used to spend in the cave. He was thinking about Allah, worshipping Allah, whatever form that looked like. But more than that, he was troubled, very troubled. Because in his mind, he had this burden that he was carrying. And that burden was, I live amongst a people that worship idols. I live amongst a people that do not worship Allah alone. On top of that, they are oppressive towards the vulnerable in society. And on top of that, they commit crimes and there is no rule of law. There is no justice. People that are weak, 
are going to be downtrodden. People that are powerful are going to have a monopoly. And these thoughts used to swirl around in his mind and he didn't know how to address them. He didn't know how to create change in the world that he was living in. And that is what placed him in a dilemma. Because on one side, he wants to go out there and say, Quraysh, don't worship idols, don't do this to your daughters, don't oppress people. But at the same time, he doesn't know what the alternative is. Okay, don't worship idols, what should we do instead? Okay, we shouldn't do things like this, how should we do them instead? He doesn't know. So there's actually a surah in the Quran where Allah tells us how this used to make the Prophet ﷺ feel. Does anyone know what surah I'm talking about? It's a short surah and it's found in Juz Am. Which surah is this? Shall I give you another clue? The first, the first verse has the word Sadr in it. Come on now, I'll give you so many clues. The first verse has the word Sadr in it, which means chest. Alam nashrah Alam nashrah laka sadrak Yes? Some people are like, oh yeah. Alam nashrah laka sadrak What does that mean? Did we not open up your chest? What does that mean? Did we not open up your chest? That means that your chest was tight, meaning you were anxious and troubled. What was that trouble? It was this time in his life where he saw his people fixate on idol worship, being unjust, being unfair, and he didn't know how to deal with such things. What is the next verse? Alam nashrah laka sadrak wa wada'na an kawizrak. And did we, not, did we not put down the thing that was burdening you? What was the thing that was burdening him? Not knowing how to create change, subhanAllah. Allah says, we knew that you were mentally and spiritually lost, struggling. And so the time had come for you to be released from this dilemma. How did Allah release him? He sent Jibreel alayhi salam. And that is the point in his life that he becomes a prophet of Allah. And we all know the story. But I want you to imagine now, because we're in the desert, we have some mountains around us. Imagine what it would have felt like if you were all by yourself on the top of the mountain, in the middle of the night, and there is a sound of another person present. And on top of that, when you turn around and you see who is this person, you do not recognize the person, even though when you live in Mecca at that time, everybody knows everybody else because it's a small town. He would have felt scared, isn't it? He would have felt scared. What does Jibreel salam do? You would think that he would say, don't worry, I'm an angel sent by Allah to elevate you. What does Jibreel salam do? Does he say that? Does he say, don't worry? No, what does he say? What does he say? He orders him to do something that he can't do. The Prophet ﷺ could not read. Instead, Jibreel ﷺ tells him to do the very thing that he can't do, Iqra. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Ma'ana biqari'. I'm not somebody who has the ability to read. And what does Jibreel ﷺ do then? Did he say to him, okay, don't worry. It's fine, don't worry about it. This is revelation of the Qur'an. I want you to recite it after me. Bismillah the way a teacher would normally do, you know, and I was just doing a tajweed lesson with some brothers and you're trying to make them comfortable, try to say, don't worry, it's okay, take it at your own pace. What did Jibreel alayhi salam do when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi says, I can't read? He hugs him and squeezes him so tight that the Prophet says, Hatta balagha minni al juhd until I reached the end of my endurance, meaning I thought I was going to pass out. He thought he was going to die. Subhanallah. Now you're thinking, why did Jibreel make it so difficult for him? And when he released him, what does he say to him? Iqra. He tells him to do the same thing that he already said he can't do. And for the second time, he squeezes him until he thinks he's going to die. And then he releases him and tells him a third time. 
And some scholars say a third time he squeezed him. And then after this traumatic experience, then Jibreel alayhi salam starts to recite to him the first five verses of the Quran. What are those verses? Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq khalaq al-insana min alaq Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi alla bil-qalam alla al-insana ma lam ya'alam these five verses are the very, five, the very first verses that the Prophet was revealed. What does Allah say? Read in the name of your Lord, who created man from what? From a clot, meaning the small blood clot that you were inside the womb of your mother, and Allah then shaped you into the form that you are now. Read in His name. And then the verses continue to say, Allah is the one who taught man how to read, how to write, how to educate themselves. And that is when the Prophet ﷺ first realized that, you know what, something is happening now, something monumental. But it's very interesting that the Prophet ﷺ doesn't leave the cave digesting what has happened and understanding it to be, this is Jibreel, this is revelation, and I become Rasulullah. Actually, when he leaves the cave, Aisha says, that his heart was pounding. And the first person he wanted to go to see was who? He wanted to go see his wife. Even though he has a best friend. Who is his best friend? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And it's interesting because sometimes in life, when you're troubled, and you pick up the phone, who do you phone first? Do the husbands phone their wife first? Do the wives phone their husbands first? Maybe they found their friend first, no? Maybe they found their friends first. Who did the Prophet go to first? He went to his wife. Now, I want you to think about this. How long did it take him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to come down from the cave to the foot of the mountain and then to walk all the way home? Roughly how long do you think it took? When you go to Mecca, you will be able to climb the mountain and it will take you about an hour. 45 minutes if you're fast. So from the foot of the mountain, walking all the way back to near the cab, but how long do you think it will take? Maybe an hour? Yeah, about an hour. So an hour and a half, let's say even two hours. From the time that he left Jibril until he reached home had been how many? Two hours. Yet when he knocks on the door, what does Khatija see? She sees her husband shivering panic-stricken, and what does he say? Zammiluni, Zammiluni. Wrap me up, wrap me up. Meaning, I need you to, to help me right now. I, my state of mind is all over the place. And then when she tells him to come inside, wraps him up, Khatija says, I waited until he became calm. And she knew her husband. She knew that this is not the time to start firing away questions. Where have you been all this time? What's got you into this state? And who spoke to you? Who said what? She waited patiently until he became calm. Then when he became calm, he spoke himself. And you know what he said? He said, لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ عَلَى نَفْسِي He said, I fear for myself. I'm scared. Imagine the vulnerability of the Prophet He said, I'm scared for myself. He said, I think I've been possessed. SubhanAllah. He thought that a, a demon, a jinn had possessed him. He, he couldn't understand. Like, who is Jibreel? Who is a, what is an angel? What are these words? And so when he said these words, not knowing what had happened, confused and panicked, what did his wife do? SubhanAllah. Look at the wisdom. Look at her character. She did not make his anxiety worse. In fact, she reassured him. And she said, Kalla wallahi ma Allahu abada. She said, I swear by Allah, he would never humiliate a man like you. She said, Allah would never do something like that to you. Because you are a person who helps the needy, who looks after the poor, and who keeps the family together. She was speaking from her fitrah. 
She didn't know Allah in the way we know Allah, but she knew that Allah will not humiliate people that are good to their family, look after poor, and take care of those who need. She knew that. And these words began to reassure the Prophet ﷺ. But he needed even more reassurance than this. So what did she do? She took him to her cousin Waraka, a man who some say was a Christian, who others say he was a scholar of the scripture. And by this time, Waraka had actually become blind. So the next day, the Prophet ﷺ and Khatija go hand in hand to visit Waraka. And you have to imagine that the Prophet Sallam, he is loved by his people. He is seen as a respectable man. And what happened in the cave last night seems to have, be something that has undermined everything. Now he doesn't know who he is. Now he doesn't know what his identity is. So when he comes to Waraka, he is very confused. And Khatija says, my cousin, ask him what happened to him last night. And the Prophet ﷺ, he tells Waraka, step by step, what happened to him in the cave, the person who came, how he hugged him and almost made him pass out, commanded him to read, and then the five verses, and then Waraka says, that was Namus, the same one who visited Musa ﷺ. Now, Namus in Arabic means the secret keeper. Jibreel's nickname is Namus because... He delivers revelation. And the revelation of Allah is a secret to every single person except the one Allah chooses to inspire with it. And so Waraka said, you know, Musa alayhi salam, he was visited by the same angel, Jibreel alayhi salam. And Waraka was now telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam that you know what, you are like Musa alayhi salam. Who was Musa? A prophet of Allah. So now you are a prophet of Allah. And then Waraka said something that really made the person's heart sink. He said, I wish that Allah would give me life long enough to be by your side when your people kick you out of Makkah. Subhanallah. The Prophet said, will they kick me out? He could not imagine a scenario in where his people would turn against him. Because right now, he is called a Sadiq al Amin. The honest person, the trustworthy person, the people, they respected him so much that when they would travel, they would leave their goods with him in his care, knowing that he would never wrong them. He's from Banu Hashim, a tribe that is prestigious. He's the grandson of who? Abdul Muttalib, the chief of Banu Hashim. How could they turn against me, he's thinking. How could that possibly happen? And Waraka explained. He said, no man comes with a message what you are going to come with except that his people turn against him. Subhanallah. What would the Prophet be doing? He would be fleeing under the cover of the night from his own home because there are assassins outside. People are trying to kill him. His own people trying to kill him and what does he have to do he has to leave Makkah that is exactly what Waraka predicted would happen word for word and the Prophet ﷺ had to see that and in one narration when he's leaving Makkah and he was on the outskirts of Makkah and he's planning how to run away and make hijrah to Medina, he turns around and he looks at Makkah and he says, You are the most <coughs> beloved land to Allah. And you are the most beloved land to me. Because he was born there, he was raised there, this is where the Kaaba is. And then he says, had it not been for the fact that my people are kicking me out, I would never have left you, subhanAllah. And so when Waraka tells him that this was going to happen, the Prophet Sallam, he starts to worry. And this is very interesting because even though now he has been given guidance 
and will receive guidance on how to help his people and to change them and to show them how to worship Allah alone, he is now placed in a, another dilemma, which is, now I know what to say, but no one will believe me. Isn't it? You start telling people that I'm a prophet of Allah and Jibreel visited me and I have the words of God. What are people going to say? They're going to say, you, you're crazy. You're a liar. But the Prophet ﷺ was now having to go on a new mission to try and bring this change into the world. And so when they left Waraka, the Prophet ﷺ went home and he started to digest his information. What does it mean? Now you remember how scary it was in the cave, right? And how traumatic it was. Guess what? As the days went by, what do you think the Prophet ﷺ started to long to do? What do you think he started to crave? Huh? To pray? Not quite. That's a good answer though. Where do you think he wanted to go? Huh? To? He wanted to go back to the cave. Imagine what happened to him. He started to long to go back to the cave. And so what happened is he started to go back the same route to the mountain, to the cave. He went a few times, nothing happened. Until one day he went and he's climbing up. He hasn't reached the cave yet. He has a voice above his head. This time, some of the scholars say, Jibreel, though the first time he appeared in the form of a human being, this time he appeared in his true angelic form. Allahu Akbar. Do you know how Jibreel looked? The Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel alayhi salam, I saw him twice in one narration three times. His feet were planted in the ground. His head was touching the clouds. <coughs> his wings, he had 600 wings. And when he would open one wing, it would fill the entire horizon, subhanAllah. The entire horizon. And he said, if he were to open more of his wings, you would see jewels, rubies and pearls falling from his wings onto the ground. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> this is Jibreel alayhi salam. So when he, when he was climbing up the mountain, he heard a voice, Jibreel alayhi salam was saying, You are Rasulullah. You are Rasulullah. And the person was looking up and the same panic and the same worry started to take over his heart again. So what did he do? He started to run again. Where did he go? Back to Khatija. Last time, what did he say? Zammiluni. Do you know what he said this time? He said, Dathiruni. Dathiruni. The first time he said, Zammiluni, which means to wrap me up. Dathiruni means to cover me up. Yes, so Khatija, she saw him at the door again. The same thing happened again. This time he's saying, cover me up. She brings him inside and uh, she puts a, a blanket or a sheet over his head. He calms himself down. In one narration, he says, bring me some water. And she puts some water over his head to relax him. And then what happens is, she, he says the same thing happened again. This time I saw Jibreel, it looked like this. And he kept saying, Anta Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah. You are the messenger of Allah. These events initially, we have to now reflect. Ask ourselves a question. Why, or oh why, was it so difficult for the Prophet ﷺ in the beginning? Why was it made so difficult? Why did Jibreel ﷺ, you know, why didn't he make it more easy on the Prophet ﷺ? Why didn't Allah, you know, make it easy on the Prophet ﷺ to initiate him in the mission of a Prophet? Why did he have to go through such a traumatic experience? It's an interesting question, no? Like when we think of Rasulullah, the most beloved to Allah, we automatically assume Allah is going to make his life the easiest. But what we learn from his seerah is what? His life was the most difficult. Which makes you then think, what does that mean about Allah loves the Prophet and yet his life was so difficult? So going back to that question, does anyone have an answer? Why did Jibreel السلام, squeeze him so tightly, make that initial interaction so difficult and uncomfortable for the Prophet? Yes. Was it to prepare him from all the struggles he was going to face? Okay, that's a good answer. What about from the sisters? What do you think? What was the, what was the wisdom behind 
such a difficult encounter. No? Think of it like a mother. I'm not saying that you squeeze your son that hard, that you think going to pass away, pass out, but what is the wisdom as a mother towards a child? Can you see a connection there? No? So what this brother said is, is very good. And that is one of the reasons why Jibreel made it so difficult in the Prophet Sallam, and why the whole ordeal was kind of traumatic is in order to signal to the Prophet Sallam that life from here on in is going to be very difficult. A lot of struggles, a lot of tests, a lot of calamities, a lot of tragedies. But you know what? Allah is always going to be there for you. That is amazing, isn't it? And what I was mean, what I was saying as a parent, is that sometimes don't you show your children tough love, mothers? Or well, some mothers don't. But it's interesting, you know, when you go, for example, you go to the park, and I'm going to be a bit stereotypical here, but forgive me, just to make an example. You go to the park, and you see, you know, let's say three mothers, they all have children playing around, okay, and then what happens typically is one of the child goes on the slide and then he goes too fast and he falls over, right? Three mothers, how do they react? The first mother jumps on top of the child. Oh my God, what happened to you? Are you okay? Searching for any issues, any bruises, any cuts. And then she hugs him and says, let's go home. Nothing's happened though. Just, just a little graze. Okay, now the third mother, the opposite, what does she do? What do you think? Serves you right. Serves you right, yeah. Serves you right. Go and do it again. Or she may make it worse by shouting at him or screaming at him and saying, you know, I told you, don't be a monkey. Right? And the child starts crying even more. Interesting. What does the second mother do? Huh? How does she, what does that look like? She balances. The child is just fallen off the slide, they're crying. How does the second mother how does this the second mother approach this? What does the mother do? Huh? What did you say? Blame the father. Blame the father? <laughs> right, that's a curveball, my brother. That was really uncanny as well. I'm getting some kind of projection here. Are you <laughs> no? Oh, okay. Blame the father, yeah. The child's like Mom, how does that help me? Like, you know, <laughs> the dad's fault. Well, the second mother, she will assess, okay, is my child making a meal of this? Is my child, you know, need to toughen up a little bit? Or maybe the mother will think, you know what? My child is about to go to a new school. New people, strangers, no friends. They need to toughen, I need to toughen up my child because if they go to this new school and they're soft, they might be bullied. Or they might say, Mom, I don't want to go to school anymore. So she may take that as an opportunity to show some tough love. Yes? Because she knows that these moments of toughening up the child will be so beneficial later on in their life. Are you following? This is the same concept here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the Prophet In fact, He loves him more than anyone. And yet, He will give him moments of pain, moments of suffering in order to strengthen him, to build him, because he's on a mission. And in order to be successful in that mission, Muslims, you need to be tough. Isn't that a lesson to all of us? It is, isn't it? And doesn't Allah make us suffer sometimes? Doesn't Allah make us feel pain sometimes? Yes. But how many of us think to ourselves, you know what, this is like when Jibreel came to the Prophet and he hugged him so tight that the Prophet thought he was going to pass out. If we were to think of it like that, maybe our struggles, maybe our suffering, maybe our pain wouldn't be that painful anymore because it would be like, this is good for me, Allah has a plan for me, and I'm going to embrace that plan. I'm going to assume that Allah is doing this to make me a tougher, more resilient person. Yes, this is the, this is the attitude that we should try to bring to our pain and difficulties in our life. We ask Allah to grant us understanding. We also ask Allah to make things easy for us as well. Okay, now let's just... Of, of, of two or three stories now. How did the beginning of the mission of the Prophet look like? 
Yes. Any memorable moments that we can share with you? Here's a few. So the first three years of his mission, everything was done privately. What that means is that the Prophet ﷺ, he's aware that his message to worship one God and one God alone and to not worship the idols is going to antagonize a lot of people. People are not going to like this. Some people are going to find that very outrageous. And so he begins to talk about Islam to the people that are closest to him. The first person to become Muslim was who? Khadija. In fact, some of the scholars they break it down like this. The first woman to become Muslim is who? Khadija. Who is the first grown man to become Muslim? Hmm? Abu Bakr Siddiq. Who is the first child to become Muslim? Huh? Ali. Ali radiallahu an is the first child. He's about nine years old at the time. He's the first child to become Muslim. Okay? So if you look at it like this, this is an easy way to understand who became Muslim first. First man, first lady, and the first child. Now this period lasted three years. Towards the end of the third year, the Quraysh, they now know that this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he's preaching a very different version of morality and spirituality. And they also know, though they are accommodating him still, that his message will not be appreciated by us. But because he's from Banu Hashim, because his uncle Abu Talib is the chief of Banu Hashim, they allow him to continue. However, Allah is going to now move the person to the next stage, which is you now need to take this call public. You now need to tell people openly. You can no longer do it privately anymore. This is now going to make matters a lot harder for the Prophet so what happens is that there's a few incidences here, some interesting incidences. The first one is the incident of uh, Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, his tribe, Ghifar, they, they lived far away from Mecca. But Abu, Abu Dhar's brother, he was interested in religion. And Abu Dhar was interested in religion. And they both were not satisfied with the idea of worshipping idols. So we're always kind of inquisitive about anything new. So Abu Dhar's brother found out that there is a man in Mecca, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who's preaching a new message about God. He told Abu Dhar, and Abu Dhar made his journey from his tribe all the way into Mecca to come find this man. He doesn't know who he is exactly. The only issue was, is that Abu Dhar's tribe were known as criminals. They were known as robbers. So he's coming with a bad reputation, right? So when he comes into Mecca, he starts like asking around, you know, is there any person here with a new message, anyone saying anything different? And no one gives him any clues. And even at that time, many Muslims, they were very cautious about who they would introduce Islam to, just in case they end up being a spy or they're going to, you know, tell on them, etc., etc. So Abu Dhar had to spend, some say eight, some say 11 days in Mecca trying to figure out who is this man, right? Eventually, Ali, he sees Abu Dhar day in, day out, you know, trying to find out, fish, fishing and stuff. And he says to him, okay, meet me here at this time and I'll take you to the man. So he meets him at the designated time. In secret, he takes him to the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Dhar finds himself in the company of the Prophet ﷺ. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ says is, who are you? So he says, I'm Abu Dhal al-Ghifari. And the Prophet ﷺ makes a gesture like this on his head. Like this. And Abu Dhal says, I knew that he would think bad of me on account of my tribe. Meaning that my tribe has a very bad reputation and the reputation precedes it. Right? So Abu Dhal says, now who are you? He says, I am Muhammad and I am a messenger of Allah. Abu Dhal says, what is the messenger of Allah? It says the message of Allah is a man who Allah has given a message to for the rest of humanity. And he says, what is this message? Now this is very interesting because the Prophet ﷺ would summarize the core message of Islam in this answer. He says, it is to worship Allah alone and it is, it is to destroy the idols and it is to be good to your family, subhanAllah. How simple was this message? 
Worship Allah alone. Don't worship any idols. And be good to your family. Being good to your family, your parents, your siblings, and your extended family, was at the very heart of the message of the Prophet from the very beginning, from the earliest stage. So Abu Dhar, he says, okay, uh, who follows you? Now the Prophet said, he's aware that Abu Dhar may be genuine, he may not be genuine. He may go out and start spreading this information to people that he shouldn't do, or he may be sincere. So the Prophet said, he gives an indirect answer. He says, one free man and one slave. Who is a free man? Who is a slave? Huh? Which way around? Uh, Abu Bakr is a free man, and then uh, Bilal is a slave. Zayd is a slave. He says Bilal is a slave. Anybody else? Who is the slave? I cheated. I saw your video. Huh? I saw your video. I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, Yusuf, very good for another another lecture, inshallah. A different lecture. <laughs> yes, there's actually a difference. Some scholars say it's Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala, and some say it's, it's Zayd. So, why did the Prophet say that when there's more than, than, than there's more followers than these two? He said that because he was being cautious. He was being sensible. He wants to protect his followers. They are few in number at that time. And what does Abu Dhar say? He says, count me in as one of your followers. And the Prophet Sallam says, okay, say, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah. Abu Dhar takes his shahada. And then what does he do? I told you about his background. He comes from tough people. So he says, I need to go and tell everyone right now. And the Prophet says, basically, are you mad? There's only a few of us. Don't do that. Don't you see the situation that I'm in right now? Don't do that. Abu Dhar, he couldn't contain it. Where does he go? He goes straight to the Kaaba and he starts to make a speech. And after some initial words and getting everyone's attention, he says... I believe that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. A mob starts to gather around him. And he continues to say that until what? They pounce on him and they start to beat him up. Until he is bruised and bloodied. His face is almost unrecognizable. And then either Abu Talib or Abbas comes and he rescues him. And he tells the people... That if you kill him, do you know who his tribe is? They're going to come after you. So they leave him. What does Abu Dhar do? He waits a day or two until his face is a bit fixed up. And then he does the same thing again. He goes to the Kaaba and he makes the same announcement and he gets beats all over again. And then what does he do? He goes back to his tribe and he starts giving them da'wah. And slowly but surely, they actually, most of them, if not all of them, convert to Islam later on. This is Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Now there is a, a similar story about Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud was one of the earliest Muslims. And Ibn Mas'ud is also one of the most knowledgeable companions about the Qur'an. Yes, he is supposed to be either the second most knowledgeable person about the Qur'an uh, uh, or the third. The first is who? Huh? No, it's... Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas is the most knowledgeable person on the Quran and the second will be Ibn Mas'ud. So what happens is that Ibn Mas'ud, he is said to have done the first khutbah of Islam. And what happened is that Ibn Mas'ud, he similarly, when he saw that the Prophet's message is spreading and there's more people, he wanted to go out there and recite Quran to people. And they had never heard Quran being recited out loud yet. And he came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to go out there and recite Quran to the people. And the Prophet said, number one, there's only in one narration 80 of us right now. Meaning there's only a few of us. And secondly, you don't come from a big tribe. You come from a very small tribe, meaning you don't have no backup. You have no one to support you if you get in trouble. And Ibn Saud, he sat on that advice for a while. Until one day, he was sat near the Kaaba. And what would happen is that there was a time of the day where all the notable people would come and they would sit in the shade of the Kaaba and then other groups of people would come and they would relax. At that time, in Mas'ud, he saw that a lot of notable people were there and so he stood up. 
and he started to do a speech, the first khutbah of Islam. The Prophet hasn't done a speech yet. Nobody's done a speech yet. He does a speech and then he recites Surat Rahman. Ar Rahman. Allam al Quran. Yes? Allam al Insan. This surah, first time he recited out loud was who? By Ibn Mas'ud. As he's reciting it, what happens? People become angry. A mob gathers around him. He continues to recite until he is beaten. Again, bruised and bloodied. And then he is taken on a stretcher. And he's taken to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, didn't I tell you? <laughs> Don't do this. Because this is what's going to happen to you. You know what he said? He said, I wish that I could do this again all over tomorrow. Just so that Allah's words could be heard by those people, subhanAllah. Now what does that teach us? On one side you're thinking that was reckless. That was reckless, why did you do that for? You just put yourself in trouble, you got beaten up. On another side, however, there's a lot of beauty there. There's bravery, there's courage. But more than that, there is this desire in Abu Dhar and Ibn Mas'ud to let people know about Islam. They wanted people to know about Islam because they cared for them. They looked at them and thought, they're going to the hellfire. We need to stop that. We need to help them. Even if it means saying something that they're not going to like. And that has a lot of relevance to us today. For example, when you're at work, imagine this scenario. You're in the canteen, you're having lunch, you have your non-Muslim colleagues there. you got Sally, you got John. And what they... Karen, yeah? Karen's always there, yeah, with their lunchbox. So they're all eating, and what do they do? They start talking about somebody behind their back. What do they call that in Islam? Ghiba, backbiting. And as a Muslim, you're sitting there and you're hearing Karen backbiting another person. She says, You see, uh, see Joseph coming today? Typically late. I mean, how long did he spend on his hair? Yeah? And you're thinking, oh my God, they're backbiting right now. That's not allowed. Should I do something? Should I say something? Oh, but if I do, they will say, oh, you're very pious today. You're very self-righteous, isn't it? Don't you have that situation come into your life? And then you're thinking, you know what, should I say something? Should I? I'll just let it slide. But actually, as a Muslim, you should be like, no, they're doing something that is displeasing Allah. I should say something. Didn't the Prophet say, if any one of you sees something wrong, he should change it with what? His hand. And if he cannot, then with what? His tongue. And if he cannot even do that, then what? He should hate it in his heart. But he said, that is the lowest form of Iman. That's the lowest. We don't want to strive for the lowest. We want to strive for the highest. So what that scenario should look like is uh, the lady is uh, tucking in not to only her lunch but the, the meat of the, bro <laughs> of the brother. Oh, you see him coming late today. He's always late. I wonder when he's going to get fired. Right? She's saying, oh, and then what you should you do as a Muslim? You should say, you know what? I don't think John would appreciate us talking behind his back. I mean, if you want to say something, you should really say it to his face. That's just what I think anyway. <laughs> what do you think? Is that better? Then letting it slide, what do you think? Is that doable? So doable. It is so do Does, is it required that you say, Sally, astaghfirullah. Make tawbah to Allah. You ate the flesh of your dead brother. Is it necessary to do that? It's not. It's only necessary to tell them in a language that they would understand. So as Muslims, we should always have that desire to help our non-Muslims. And what that looks like is teaching them what is the better way to live their life. And trust me, they want to hear about it. They want to hear... Let me tell you the story of this brother, Bilal. I met this brother. He's a, he's a black brother who reverted many years ago. But when you look at him, he doesn't have a beard. He doesn't look obviously Muslim. And he told me something very interesting. He works for a very big company. And he said that we went to work uh, 
we went down to, he lives in Ipswich, he went down to London, he said we went in the head office and the most senior management person was working with us that day and the manager, non Muslim guy, he said, you know what, you guys have done great, I'm going to take you all out for a drink after work, who's in? Everyone's like, yes, yes, Bilal was thinking, no, I don't want to go, but did he say anything? No, he waited until the last minute where everyone's packing up their things, getting ready to go to the pub and Bilal says, see you later guys, bye and he goes home so somebody calls him, a Muslim guy from work who <laughs> went to the pub, he calls him up and he says Bilal, what are you doing man, everyone's asking like, where were you? that was really rude, the manager himself invited you so Bilal's like, oh man, yeah the thing is, they go to the pub, isn't I don't drink, and, I, and he goes, yeah, but you know, you should have done it in a better way. So Bilal said, okay. Next day he went to work, he said to the man, listen, I'm very sorry, because I'm Muslim, I don't drink, and I couldn't go to the pub. But you know what, I'll make it up to you. When you come up to Bristol, I will take you out for a meal. The manager's like, yes, that's great, let's do that. And Bilal was thinking, that's never going to happen. But it did. He went to Rift Switch. Now he's working alongside Bilal, the whole day goes by, Bilal knows he's got to take him out to dinner, the manager knows Bilal's taking him out to dinner, Bilal doesn't say anything. Until the last minute, and everyone's packing up their things to go home, what does Bilal do? Alright guys, see you later, bye. <laughs> he goes home. Now the Muslim guy phones him again, he says, Bilal, what are you doing man? You promised to take him out to dinner. So Bilal says, I know, but the thing is, I know if I take him out to dinner, he's going to want alcohol. And I'm going to be paying for the alcohol. At least last time I wasn't paying for it. So, oh, I think uh, the alcohol story is... Does it bring it closer? Is the battery dead? The battery's dead. Okay, I'll finish with the story. So, Bilal says that the first time I, I was uh, participating in alcohol, this time I'm going to buy the alcohol. So he says, yeah, but you should have told him. He said, I didn't know how to say it. It's awkward. So the guy says, you know what? I will speak to the manager and I'll tell him what happened. So the next day he comes to work and the manager says to him, Bilal, I want to talk to you. So they sat down and the, you know what the manager said? The manager said, you know what? I respect you. You don't care if you upset your boss you only care if you upset God. I respect you. Imagine that. Even though he went about in the complete the wrong way, non-Muslims, when they look at us, you know what they see? They see principled people. People that aren't afraid to be different because they believe in something. Now how silly is it that as Muslims, we feel shy to talk about the thing that makes us unique. Go back to work and we're in the canteen the next time and we see our non-Muslim colleagues, take a moment to share something about Islam. It can be so easy. Think about a conversation starter. For example, they say, you know, the, the go-to conversation is what? How are you doing? And you say, what? Well, I'm fine. That's dead. Forget that. Instead, when they say, how are you doing? You could say, oh, you know what? I just got back from this amazing trip. I know you have to lie, but... <laughs> You can say that anyway. I came back from this amazing trip and they're going to be like, what's the next thing they're going to say? What was it all about? Or what are you going to say? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you, isn't it? So now you have just created a beautiful conversation about Islam and about the Prophet ﷺ and about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So going forward, let us learn some lessons. And one of them is, let us share our message with the non-Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Share from me, even if all you know is one verse of the Qur'an. And we all know one verse of the Qur'an. Yes, inshallah we'll stop here. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to teach us about the life of our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the next life that we get to meet our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And maybe we get to sit with him like we are sitting here today. And we get to hear the story directly from him. Say insha'Allah. Jazakumullah khairan. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Barakallahu feekum. And insha'Allah, I think the food should be here now.